I signed up for his workshop and it was nothing short of changing my life. For a week after I was done, after the workshop, I felt like I was floating on clouds. It, it was like as if the stress was happening outside of me, but was doing nothing to my body. So I thought, let's reach out to Michael and see if he would be so gracious as to come on to my podcast and talk to a broader audience about what breath works is, how it benefits, how it was all started and his experience. Hello and welcome to the Health Wizard Podcast. I'm your host, Yelena Isoldi Medici, a health and life coach. I'm so excited that you're choosing to listen to my podcast because you are choosing to make your health your priority. The Health Wizard Podcast is dedicated to teaching natural, easy to implement practices that you can use to get your health on track and become the person you used to be before getting sick and the person you're dreaming of becoming again, happy, healthy, full of energy and living a life filled with joy. Now, very quickly, before we dive into the good stuff, I want to remind you that this podcast is intended for education and entertainment purposes only. This podcast is not a substitute for professional medical advice. If you have a medical condition, please seek the help of a licensed medical professional. I am not a medical doctor. I do not treat, diagnose, prescribe, or make claims outside of my areas of expertise. So by choosing to listen to the Health Wizard podcast, you take full responsibility for your own actions. And when you hear the testimonials of the people who were able to get well, realize that their outcomes depended on their effort and their specific situation. With that said, let's jump into today's episode. Please enjoy. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Elena Zoldi Medici, and I want to welcome you to the Health Wizard podcast. I always look for new tools in my life to improve not only my life and my health, but also to help my clients to get to their healing as fast as possible. So I work with women and men who have thyroid conditions, autoimmune conditions, uh, hormone imbalances, infertility, digestive disorders. And what I find without a fail that the diet alone, by addressing diet alone is never enough. It, what I always find is that emotional health will eventually amount to about 80% of their ability to self-heal. So as I was on the market and in search of something that can help me get through the stressful times of COVID and the riots and all that, one of my friends recommended to try Breathworks. And I said, oh my God, what is Breathworks? So I went into searching and I came across a website run by Michael Stone, whom I'm going to bring on shortly. And he was offering a uh, workshop on, on breathing. I was like, okay, well, breathing is not going to hurt me. Let's try it out. And I signed up for his workshop and it was nothing short of changing my life. For a week after I was done, after the workshop, I felt like I was floating on clouds. It, it was like as if the stress was happening outside of me, but was doing nothing to my body. So I thought, let's reach out to Michael and see if he would be so gracious as to come on to my podcast and talk to a broader audience about what breath works is, how it benefits, how it was all started and his experience. So without further ado, what I want to do is bring on Michael Stone. He reminds me so much of my journey as well. Back in the day, I majored in engineering and Michael is a chemical engineer. I am a neuroscience geek and he studied neuroscience as well. And now his passion is transforming people's lives. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Please introduce yourself and please take a moment to tell me about how you uncovered Breathworks and what led you to do what you do now. I, am, I was originally in chemical engineering, and my mind kind of works in a very scientific way. It's just how I was born, and uh, I was always attracted to that. I had a fairly kind of, I would say, normal childhood, and my imprint from childhood was, okay, I'm happy. I, it seems like my parents are happy. I'm going to follow. This is all unconscious, of course. I'm going to follow the imprint that they're giving me. This is how life should be. You know, you should go through school, you should go through graduate school, you should uh, get married and have kids when you're in your 30s, you should work for a big company like my dad did. So I was kind of going through life with that imprint. So I got my chemical engineering degree, I got an advanced degree, I was working in the sciences, working in engineering, and on the surface, my life looked really awesome. I was making good money, I had a good job. 
I was very good at solving puzzles and that's why I, I did well in work and I was moving ahead in my business life. But on the inside, I always felt like there was something missing. I just felt very disconnected, but I couldn't figure out what the problem was. Like, even though I was kind of, okay, I'm smart. I can figure this out. I could not figure it out. And it kind of manifested in a big way in my relationships. And no matter what I tried, it seemed like I could not have a successful relationship, which created a tremendous amount of anxiety in me because I had this imprint in my mind, you have to get married when you're in your thirties. And it's like, oh my God, I can't make this work. And so I was in complete frustration about it. I was reading books about relationships and uh, nothing seemed to work. And in addition to that, every time I got into a relationship, not only didn't it work, but it seemed to end in a lot of drama, you know, dramatic breakups where I felt like, why are these women so crazy? You know, why can't I, why can't this work? I didn't realize at the time it had nothing to do with the women. It was all me <laughs> at the time though. I didn't get that. So I was just going through life, you know, being successful in business, but being very frustrated in many of these other parts of my life and feeling like there was something missing. And then um, when I got into my thirties, I was transferred to the East coast in my job and got a promotion. I was in like 32, 33 and my imprint was time to get married. That's when my parents got married. So I met a woman. It was kind of like she wasn't exactly right, but I was so strongly imprinted that this is the right time. I said, okay, we've got to make this work. So I got married and which didn't last very long. And obviously if you come from a space of who cares about the person, it's just time to get married. It's never going to work. So it didn't work. And I had this, again, this kind of uh, dramatic breakup. And that completely imploded my whole kind of imprint of what my life was going to be like. I kind of, in my mind, I was going, I've missed the timing. I'm going to be too old to have kids. This is never going to work now. So I really had to start to reevaluate everything that had happened in my life and what I wanted to do. And then I ended up getting transferred to Europe. So I started to look at all these decisions I made. And the first one that I shifted was I had said, okay, I'm going to work for this big company and just kind of get this nice retirement. I said, is that really what I want? And I said, no, that's not what I want. I really want to have my own company. So I came back to the U.S., started my own company, you know, so I was as much happier in my business life, but still completely blocked in kind of, first of all, being in my head. I had a very difficult time kind of getting connected to my emotions um, and having relationships and just feeling disconnected. And then um, at a certain point, many years later, I met a woman that I wanted to date, but she was still living with her ex-boyfriend. So I'm going, hmm, <laughs> how am I going to get her out of there so I can date her? And then one day she said, oh, I want to go to Peru. I went, okay, why do you want to go to Peru? She said, uh, I want to go down there on the Amazon River and I want to see the pink dolphins. I'm going, okay, I'm in. Even though I had no desire to go to Peru, I ended up in Peru. And it took me into this experience that was completely unexpected and, ch and changed my life, really. And so basically me and her went out to this area that this uh, woman had uh, bought to set up as kind of this uh, wildlife preserve on, on the Amazon. And we went out with the shaman, the local shaman who came with us. He was just this little guy, about four foot 10 inches tall, didn't speak any English. Almost no one spoke English there. And the first night we're out there, he said, would the two of you like to go through this religious uh, ceremony that we have down here? I never say just yes to those kind of things. I always, I always want to know. Listen, you're an engineer. As engineers, <laughs> right, exactly. our mind does not work on that. Personally, I go with skepticism first, prove it to me, then we can talk about experiences. Exactly. Yeah, that was exactly where I was at. So I said, okay, what do we have to do? And he goes, oh, it's very simple. I go out into the uh, rainforest. I grab these vines and these leaves. I put them all in this pot, boil them together, and you drink it. I'm going, no way. <laughs> I'm going, chemical engineer, you put 542 grams of this and 0.56 <laughs> grams of this. You don't like boil up this witch's brew from the stuff you grab from the forest. Well, and, and then it. it's unpredictable, right? What happens to me as an engineer, as a person, I'm like, I want to be in control. If you're going to tell me I'm going to drink something that like ayahuasca or something, I'm like, no, 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 we're in control here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're in exactly the same space in that. So I was ready to tell him. And it was ayahuasca, but I had no idea what that was at that time. And so I was ready to go. There is no way I'm going to do this. But this girl I'm with says, yeah, let's do this. We got to do this. So then I'm really stuck because it's like, 
I spent all this time and money to get down here, like to look good and to get to know her. And she's ready to go. Am I going to wimp out? You know, so I'm like, oh God. So anyway, ultimately social pressure won over. And I said, okay, if I'm going to die, at least it's in the rainforest. I'm in a beautiful setting. You know, it was a pretty okay. girl on my arm, right? Exactly right. Okay, let's, <laughs> okay, whatever. So anyway, so we ended up doing what, you know, was ayahuasca. And I had this amazing experience. It was really the first time in my life that I ever really felt this kind of connection to the world and connection, this amazing connection to other people, like this kind of oneness. And I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. This is, I've never felt this before. So I had this experience and then a week later came back. It didn't work out at all with the girl so, or the woman. And, but it, it changed my life because when I got back, it's like, you know, from my whole kind of science geek mind, I'm going, okay, if I can have this kind of experience with the substance, then the receptors are there in my brain. So there must be other ways to activate those receptors to have that same type of experience. So that put me on this kind of quest, this journey to find a more natural way to have that type of experience. And I checked out a ton of different stuff. And most of it, I discarded immediately. As soon as like, if I said, okay, went to this modality and the person said, yeah, it was great. The, the person who developed this just closed his eyes one day and downloaded it from the universe. And now he does it. I'm going, no, X. <laughs> I get in, in engineer's mind, I think we, our, our brains work so much alike. It's, it, it's hilarious to me because that's exactly my process. Like if you do all this and they like to be in control, there has to be a better way. But just that's how I look at programs and things. I'm like, no, nah, there, there has to be. It cannot be just like, oh, and I had divine inspiration. And I'm all for divine inspirations. But I, I think logically first, then the inspiration comes after. That. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly how my mind works. So, but ultimately, I found this one modality that's called holotropic breathwork. And it really appealed to me because it was developed in a scientific way. And the creator, whose name is Dr. Stan Groff, was originally many, many years ago involved in LSD psychotherapy. He's a um, psychiatrist. And when it was first developed and they were trying to see if it had any, any value for therapy and that type of thing. And he was getting these amazing results with people who were able to kind of get beyond their ego mind, which is normally like in regular talk therapy, uh, talk therapy works in certain conditions. But one of the issues is, is that you never get beyond this kind of ego thinking mind where you're, you're interacting through them, through that piece of your brain. Basically. Well, yeah, it's all the frontal cortex and so yeah. your speech abilities, but you don't go into the subconscious mind, which actually is the driving force of who you are. Exactly. And it's, it's always kind of like, there's always this, at least for me, when I was in talk therapy, because I tried it for many years, there was always a piece of me. It was about looking good. It was like, do I really want to tell her this thing that I think is horrible that I did or that I, whatever, do I really want to divulge that? So it was always this kind of internal battle. With LSD, that, that piece of your brain, that, that ego mind is kind of dissolved or it's much less strong. So you, you can really get access to this inner stuff and not feel uncomfortable about talking about it and releasing it. So um, Stan found that he was getting these amazing results with LSD psychotherapy with people that he'd worked with in talk therapy for many years and gotten stuck with. So when you know, LSD was banned due to all of the party use and stuff like that, he started on this quest to find another way to allow people to have these amazing kind of personal growth healing types of experiences. Sounds so much like what you were setting out to do. Ayahuasca, great, but how can we make it more mainstream? Exactly, yeah. And so ultimately, um, he studied what historical societies he had done, like shamanic societies. He did some studies with consciousness theory. And he found that there were basically these threads of things that were common when people wanted to access these states. And one had to do with, for a large percentage of time, there was something to do with the breath. And for instance, in Buddhist meditation, you're watching the breath. And so the, the second part is there was something having to do with sound. Like in, uh, when a uh, shaman wanted to put themselves into this trance state where they were connecting to, to guidance or whatever, they would do rattling or drumming. And so basically he started to practice with people. And so he got these groups at Esalen that he worked with for 30 days at a time and experimented with different combinations of breath and sound and to see what would work and what format and structure would be ideal for people to drop as deeply as possible into these healing states 
in a one day workshop structure. And so he worked for about a year on that for, for quite a long time. And ultimately what he came up with, what is now called holotropic breathwork and it's been done for 50 years around the world. And so, you know, when I heard this story, I'm going, yes, this is like really, he experimented, he checked it out, he researched, you know, from a scientific perspective. So I immediately was drawn to try it out. And my first breathwork experience, holotropic breathwork experience, had very kind of a similar style to what I'd experienced in ayahuasca down in Peru. I'm going, oh my God, this is amazing. I found it here. And so, you didn't have to boil anything. You didn't have yeah. to measure anything. And you didn't have to wonder if you're going to die or not. Exactly. All I had to do is lay down and breathe. It was crazy. Yeah. So, so it's like I started doing holotropic breath work. And what's interesting was in the first series of sessions, I really got to the bottom of what was going on with my relationships and why I was unable to have a successful one and why I was feeling so disconnected to the world. Isn't it amazing instead of years in therapy and going deep digging, you just had to breathe through it to understand what was going on. Yeah, it, it is amazing. It's, it's like, because you know, one of the things in breath work, which I'll talk about later, is it kind of makes this kind of ego mind much less active. So you get much better connection to this kind of inner intelligence that you have. It's, it's just really beautiful. And so what I saw was in, in the series of breathwork sessions, um, both of my parents were born in Germany. They're Jewish. So they were kind of a Nazi escapees. So they both barely escaped with their lives. And they had a very strong historical connection to Germany. Like on my mother's side, um, her, her father, my grandfather got the Iron Cross for heroism in World War I. My, um, a couple generations back, um, one of my ancestors basically saved the entire city where, where she was born in and grew up by paying Napoleon not to burn it down, to like go around it and leave, and leave it be. And then one day they had to run for their lives. So even though like they didn't tell me how to think about that, it was kind of like as a child, you know, you make your own meanings out of things. And when I heard these stories, I made this unconscious decision that, okay, if you can't even trust your country, you can't even trust a place where you've helped the country, helped the city, been a part of that society for hundreds of years, who can you trust? Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of made this decision when I was a child that the world is an unsafe place, period. And you can't trust anything. So you've got to watch your back. So that was this unconscious decision that had kind of been with me through my entire life. And as you can imagine, if you're in a relationship and you're coming from a place that you can't trust the other person, there's no way you're ever going to have a successful relationship. And that's what was happening. And it was like, I was never fully allowing myself to open my heart and to really fully be in the relationship because I, I was in this place of self-protection and distrust. So as you can imagine, I'd gone through all this time thinking that it was all about these, these uh, crazy women. And, it, and the, re the reality was I was making them crazy because I wasn't dropping in. I was holding myself back. And so that, of course, that was extremely frustrating for them. So I finally saw, yes, the common factor is not these women, it's me. I was making this happen all the way through. So once I saw that, I could shift it and I could start trying to be in a different way. And I, and I had this feeling, you know what? That's this imprint from childhood that this four or five-year-old child, a decision that that child had made about the story that he heard. And it also allowed you to, in a sense, you stepped out of victimhood. Exactly. And you stepped into this full ownership of who you are and that you have the power to change it. Because if you believe things are happening to you, you can't change that. That's the problem of our society right now. But you are realizing that you are the creator subconscious at that time. Unconsciously, we're creating your life. But by understanding that, you also knew that you could take the power back and recreate something. 100%. That's, that's exactly correct. So... In essence, I took my power back in the area of relationship and, and breath work allowed me to do that. And, you know, after that happened, it completely shifted who I was in the relationship and therefore who the other person was. And, you know, now I've been in an eight year relationship that's just really supported my own growth and I'm supporting the other person. I feel really good about it. It's healthy. And I could never have been in this relationship without having that experience and understanding what was going on in my unconscious and how I was 
kind of just keeping myself in this repetitive loop. So I was able to break out of my conditioning and break out of the loop. So basically then I decided, okay, I've got to be able to offer this to other people. It's, it, this is such an amazing experience for me. I want to allow other people in my life and in my city to have that same experience. So I went through a three-year facilitation training in holotropic breathwork and started to facilitate these workshops in Los Angeles and in Southern California. People were having mind-blowing experiences. And it isn't like every experience you have is, oh my God, this is, this is crazy. It's a journey just like anything else in life. But over a series of experiences, people were shifting. People were opening up their life. People were more self-empowered. People were shifting things for other people in their lives. And the one frustration that I had with that, I mean, it's an amazing modality, but the one frustration I had is that putting together a whole Tropic Breathwork workshop, which is an all-day experience, it's just a tremendous amount of work. This huge venue, everybody's sitting or laying in mats and stuff like that. And so it's a tremendous amount of work. You have to have one trained facilitator for each 10 people participating. You fly in people from other cities. And so I just couldn't do them that often. I was doing maybe five, six, seven a year, and that was pretty much it. And that also means you were limited on how many people you could help. Exactly. Yeah, that was my frustration. And then people were constantly asking me and saying, oh my God, I'm getting these experiences that are really creating changes in my life, but I want to make this into a practice like a yoga. I don't want to wait three months till the next mm -hmm. workshop. I want to really bring this more powerfully into my life. And at the time, I didn't really have an answer for them on how to do that because it was only being offered, you know, very few times. And at a certain point, I, and this was ultimately came to me out of another breathwork session. I really got this strong imprint that part of the reason that I exist on this planet, just kind of a little background, I strongly believe that everybody has their own unique gift to give to the world based on their, their own background, based on the own obstacles they've overcome. And everybody has something to offer the world that nobody else can offer. And it's just like, it's, you know, whether you want to call it their mission or whatever, you know, everybody has their own gift that they have to give to the world. And for me, I was never really in touch with what that was. And, you know, at a certain point in my breath work, I said, okay, I can do this. I can hold space for people. I can allow them to be in a safe space so that they can have these experiences. It's part of my job right now, like to figure out how I can do this in a way where larger numbers of people can have the experience where, I can, where it can really spread throughout the world and it can really have an impact on human consciousness and just the, the changes that we so desperately need in the world right now in terms of kind of pushing it onto a healthier path. So I came out of the breath work and I'm going, okay, I have no idea how I'm going to do this. And part of it is, is that in the holotropic breath work, you've, you're given a certain format. It's like, okay, breath work has to be done in person. There's got to be a facilitator present there. And that was kind of my imprint about what breath work was. And ultimately I said, okay, I'm going to give myself a task of figuring this out. And part of what my neuroscience background had taught me is that if you don't set your goals high enough, you're never going to really be able to blast through in life. It's kind of like, I was always historically setting my goals to what I kind of knew I could do. Okay, I'm making 40,000 now, let's make a goal for 50,000. Mm -hmm. And I already kind of knew my pathway there, but I was never willing to set big goals that I could fail at. What I learned through neuroscience is once you set a goal, your brain will start trying to figure it out. Once you say, this is gonna happen, your brain will start to work and, and start to bring you possibilities. And so I said, okay, I'm going to figure this out I'm going to figure out how to do it. And I'm going to set a goal of bringing breath work to 10 million people. And immediately my ego mind said, are you crazy? You're going from, from like 50 people in a workshop to 10 million. This is impossible. Mm -hmm. And which is like ego mind stuff. It's always kind of self doubting. It's like, you can't do this. You can't do that. And I'm going, no, nope, we're, we're going for this. <laughs> we're going to figure it out. So ultimately, you know, when I started looking into this, clearly the only way to do it is online. My ego mind goes, yeah, but the way you learned it, it can't be done online. It won't work. I'm going, okay, I understand that, but I'm going to check this out for myself. And so I started really working and I kind of, kind of uh, stole this from Stan in terms of, in terms of, okay, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but let's start experimenting and really working with people and just see what happens doing 
doing it scientifically, doing surveys afterwards and seeing what works and what doesn't. Let's really test. So I spent the next you know, many months, like about six months, basically starting doing breath work online with people, finding this kind of technology that would make it work and just seeing will it work or won't it work. And amazingly enough, it absolutely works. And all of my doubts that I had about can it work, can it not work, will people drop in? I really dispelled those by actually working with people over a period of many, many months. And what I saw was that even with like one of my questions was one of the things that allows people in in person breath work to drop in so deeply is this kind of experience of being in this tribe, being in this group that's going through something together. And what I found was online, people still get that feeling of connection. If you set it up correctly, if you prepare it correctly, if you set the kind of background correctly, people do feel that and it does support them in their experience. And that people do drop into these amazing experiences, even when they're laying in their bed, you know, with their headset on and, and listening to music and doing and it. And that, that was my experience when I signed up for your workshop. My experience was I didn't want to travel. I wanted something. My kid, I put her to sleep and I logged into your, it's literally, it's real life experience. And quite an experience I was, which I'm going to have a ton of questions for you now. So you guided and you facilitated your teaching people, you know, doing your introduction, how this is going to work. And I, I never expected that breathing can do so much. That's where I want to go with you next, Michael. So breathing, okay. I mean, why breathing? Why not the, the ayahuasca or LSD? Why breathing? And how does it really do the work? And what does it do when we start breathing at this level? So, um, breath work is not new. People have understood that working with the breath and having conscious control of the breath and breathing with certain styles or rhythms can impact you very strongly for thousands of years. And in fact, uh, if you go back even 4,000 years in the uh, Bhagavad Gita, which is one of the Indian um, sacred books, they were already talking about breath and it was, it's called pranayama and it's been used in yoga for thousands of years. So this is not like this new woo-woo thing that's just been developed 40, 50 years ago. So people have understood this for a long time. And I think the, that the Westerners have had an aversion to that. So if you, to some Westerners, nothing anymore, but in the beginning, if you bring yoga and other things, people are like, oh, it's a or new age, it's new woo-woo, but you are breaking it down on the, on the level of science and physiology. So that makes it slightly different. Right. And so, so in essence, when you do breath work, what you're doing is, or at least this type, every breath works a bit different. And I'm talking about the breath work, you know, that I created to do online with the structure that I created which I call neurodynamic breath work and where you do basically faster, deeper breathing over a period of time, you're making certain changes in your body physiologically. And through the faster, deeper breathing, your blood gets more alkaline and there's these physical physiological changes where certain parts of your brain have a little bit less activity and other parts have more. And one of the parts that has less activity is what we call the default mode network. And this is not something that was even known about more than, you know, two decades ago. So it's fairly, it's a fairly new discovery in science. And it's the part of your brain and the frontal cortex is included in that, that is responsible for the mental constructs of self and ego. Mm -hmm. So when there's kind of less activity in that part of the brain, it supports this kind of temporary dissolution of the ego mind, which allows you to connect to, um, I call it inner intelligence, inner guidance, inner intuition. When Stan Groff started it, he called it inner healer. But it's this basically this part of our psyche that is connected to this universal field of information that already has all the answers that we need. And it's, it's also a part of this is your body wisdom. It's like your body is running these trillions of tasks every day without your thinking mind having to do anything. And it's, when you think about it, it's just amazing that it works. And it's, all and it's this, amazing and it's a, such a fresh approach, Michael, because if we look in Western medicine, we are thinking about our body as a machine, right? Yeah. We don't think about it something so wise that, that you can go and say, 
like you did, you uncovered the problem in your relationships through connecting to your body, not outside of yourself, but within yourself. We're in Western society, we're taught, listen, and, and the women that I work with, hey, you have hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's, let's radiate it. Right. Let, let's cut it out. Let's cut out your uterus. Let's cut off your breasts. And the medicine does not look like this. There's wisdom and there's probably wisdom that your body is trying to tell you, you need to fix something. That's why I'm malfunctioning. Whereas in what you're talking about, we can actually go to the body to tap into it. So yes, the blood is more alkaline, but I almost feel also part of this for me was that in a Western society, especially now, we don't breathe deeply enough. So we don't get oxygenated through our body. So it's, mm -hmm. we're, we're right here. We're, we're from the chest to, to the mouth, but it doesn't yeah. get our, our, we don't get the nutrients from the, the air that we need in order to function right. in a healing way. And, you know, part of the reason for that is because a very shallow breath is more like a stress breath. And people, like historically, like when you breathe in a shallow way, it's, it's because there's some kind of threat from the outside world in essence. So you want to keep your attention on the outside world where there's some danger. Deeper breathing is more of like brings your attention inside. Mm. So, and, you know, back in the day when... Uh, it was like, okay, every once in a while, let's say a dinosaur is running after you or something. So you have to put your attention out there. But, but there wasn't as much psychological stress as there is now. It's like we go out in the world, we're constantly feeling stress. Well, we have this attached to us, don't we? Exactly. It's you know, like, oh, I'm not stressed enough. Let's see what's yeah. going on. What are the coronavirus numbers or, or how many riots are going on there? So we're attached to stress and we willingly submit to it because we're now conditioned. I think it was on your website, right? As I was getting ready for it, I found a, a beautiful quote that you've written and I'm going to paraphrase it, but I think it's so uh, in place to be mentioned here. So I'm paraphrasing you now. You said that we spend enormous amounts of time focusing on and controlling what we put into our bodies and almost no time focusing on what we put into our minds. Right. We have been hypnotized into believing that we have very little control over our reality, over our health and over our emotional state because we're programmed to be submitted to the frontal cortex mind. But you went on to say, and this is what I love very much, if we are to effectively transform our life from one dominated by fear and anxiety, and this is exactly what we're talking about right now, to one overflowing with joy and creation, we must understand how our mind works and how our bodies work. When we do this, we can use this experience uh, to experience real freedom by creating a new reality entirely of our own making. Now that puts us in a creative mode completely and connects us back to the body. So what I'm hearing you say is by focusing not on the outside world and the danger, but by breathing so deeply that the body, the blood becomes alkaline, it shuts off that overdriven stress response that goes inside. We can tap into that intelligence that can be, it can be a revelation about what's going on, but it can also be healing. It was for me. I came yeah. out of your workshop and my body was doing, and I, I want to talk about this in a moment, but my body was doing crazy things on the floor. I thought like I was doing ballet, but, but floor bound, <laughs> but I felt like I needed to follow my body. You asked us and I trusted that my body would lead me in the right way. So if my body needed to shake or twist, I was like, okay, I trust you because I, you have this innate wisdom, inner healer in you that I need to follow you. And of course I was not let down. And, you know, the interesting thing is when, you, you know, you were asking about what makes breath work work, that there is the science, the physiological aspect, but another incredibly important piece of it, part of the instructions are in breath work is to let whatever wants to happen, happen, not to suppress anything, to really just surrender to the process, to just allow, you know, if sounds want to come out, allow the sounds. If movement wants to come, just allow. If emotions want to come up, just allow it to come up. And not to look for an explanation. I think that our Western, so my mind, I'm an engineer by training, right? I look for cause and effect. Here in the process, where I have, like you said, thousands of human uh, years of human experience and in your now experience, you just surrender to the process without asking why, because it's not necessary anymore. Yeah, exactly. And it's very, very different than how we lead our everyday lives. Because our lives are in a constant state of suppression. It's about looking good. It's about uh, not failing. It's about not seeming weak. So basically, we're taught from childhood about suppression, you know, about things that are not okay to express and not okay to do, or, or not okay to feel even. And even, you know, you were talking about um, Western medicine. 
you know, Western medicine definitely has its place. There are times when you really do need medication, you know, to, you know, for certain things. But it, if you look at, um, like, for instance, just if people are feeling depressed or anxious, it's like when you go in, an MD doesn't have time to spend four hours with you, five hours, and to do work and lay you down and have you do breath work or do something like that. So they do what they can do in, in, the, in the half hour, which is they give you whatever, an antidepressant pill or whatever it is. Uh, I don't think we which, get a half hour. It's 15 minutes usually. 15, 15 minutes, minutes, whatever. And, and nobody's yeah. ever going to ask you how... Oh, what were your grandparents like in Germany? What was going on with you? Nobody has time for that because they need to see 20 people a day. And it does work on a short-term basis. You will f feel better as the medicine suppresses this stuff into your system. Mm -hmm. But on a long-term basis, you know, and this is again, the philosophy of breath work, the, you know, in, you know, coming from a, a different way is really the only way to really process through this stuff is to allow yourself to kind of really fully feel it, express it, and release it and get it out of your system. And so it's coming from a bit of a different kind of you know, perspective. And this whole thing about everybody has, their psyche is designed naturally to keep you in a place of health and wholeness. And you know, where you're gonna have good energy, where otherwise the human species wouldn't have survived if that wasn't there. And it's just that like with our ego mind constantly chatting and all the negative self-talk we're doing all the time, we get very disconnected from the capability. And well, especially with such high accessibility that we can go and pop an antidepressant in or something. I agree with you. There's a time and place for medication. When my husband needed brain surgeries, I was very happy we had yeah. surgeries and the drugs, but chronic conditions of stress, depression, anxiety, we need to find out what makes it so before medicating. Another great point that you made very early on in this conversation is if we have receptors for those medications, that means our body can naturally produce those chemicals to satisfy the need. Exactly. So, yeah, so, so basically, again, this comes from, okay, let's get in touch with this inner guidance, this inner intelligence, let's connect, and let's get the information that we need right now to deal with whatever's happening in our body, what's ever happening in our psyche, what's ever blocking us in our life. So we can bring that to consciousness and, and basically use that to move forward. And there's an amazing variety of experiences people can have in breath work. And it's really about letting go of any intention, any expectation, because you don't want your ego mind driving the process and trying to figure out what needs to happen. Your ego mind was what kind of created the problem in the first place. So it's <laughs> yes. kind of like, you, it's really just about letting go. And it's a very, what I call a feminine energy modality. Because it's not about like this, I'm going to push through this. I'm going to make this happen. It's totally the opposite. It's more about a let go, an opening up, a surrendering. And it's, to, to me, it's just a very, very beautiful aspect of it, that it's not about trying to make something happening. It's just about connecting to your own inner power, to your own inner wisdom. And it starts to create the sense of self-empowerment because you start to see, I already have all the answers within. I don't have to give my power away to get the answers. I don't have to ask someone else, what's my purpose in life? I can't figure it out. Or, or, uh, or how can I deal with this? It's just more about connecting to the this amazing field of information that you already have inside. And when, when I first got into breath work, there wasn't really a lot of science behind that. But now if you, if you do more research, there are like papers that are published in quantum science publications where they actually do have theories about how this actually works. And so that, I was very happy about that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, I, I love quantum <laughs> physics. Quantum physics is my love. So whenever I find something that will solidify my own theory on something, it gets me super excited. Yes. So in essence, like just summarizing this kind of how breath work works, it's, it's the physiological changes. It's this letting yourself go, giving yourself permission to release, which is incredibly powerful. And some people even start to have their experience even before they start to do the faster, deeper breathing because they've just told their psyche, you know what? I've been telling you my entire life, suppress this in. This is not safe to feel. Forget all about that. I'm mm -hmm. changing the instruction now. It's okay. Just let it come. I, I'm ready. I can handle this. Just let it out. It's all right. And sometimes people can immediately drop into an experience from that. Well, it it is a healing experience because I, I, I'm sure you end up working with all kinds of people. 
I do, so again, I'm a science geek and uh, the engineering and physics background is something I'm grateful for because I sat down and I calculated mm -hmm. how the percentage of our clients that come to us, what kind of background they have without a fail we've seen that there's a lot of trauma in people's lives. It could be emotional mm -hmm. neglect, abuse, physiological, psychological, sexual abuse or neglect, things like that. So the whole idea of trusting that you have your guards up is a healing process for them because the whole life they've learned, if you've been hurt once, you need to keep your guards up, but by surrendering to even your breath, that can be a scary but a freeing experience at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, many times people can have experiences where, let's say they had something happen to them in their childhood and <clears throat> they've always kind of allowed that to hold them back in some way where they've, they've, you know, created this thing in their brain. Okay. This happened to me when I was eight years old, you know, and so I'm damaged in some way. Many times in breath work, you can actually have an experience where that whole perception completely shifts. And, and just kind of one example is there was this one woman that came to breath work and she'd had a very difficult childhood where she felt like her, her mother was very emotionally abusive to her. And she hadn't talked to her mother in like over 15 years. She just had completely disconnected from her. And in one of her breath works, she had this experience of actually being in her mother's body when her mother was a child, actually mm -hmm. experiencing her mother's childhood in a sense. And what she saw was that, at least in this breathwork experience, was that her grandmother, her mother's mother, had treated her mother a hundred times worse. And she'd gone through this incredibly intense abuse of both phys physically and emotionally abusive relationship in her childhood that her mother never told her about, never talked about. And when she got through the breathwork, she actually called her mother for the first time in like 15 years and said, Mom, this is hard to explain, but I had this very odd experience where I kind of saw that this is kind of what happened to you in your childhood. Did it really happen like this? And her mother said, you know, more or less, yes, that did happen. And in that moment, she completely shifted her story and the meaning she'd created about what happened in her childhood from my mother doesn't like me. You know, there's something mm -hmm. wrong with me. That was how she held it. And to, you know what, my mother was just passing on this imprint from her grandmother. And she, she just didn't know any better. And it completely shifted not only her view about herself, her view about her childhood, and she was able to recreate her, her relationship with her mother. So you, your past doesn't have to hold you back. You know what I mean? It's, it's so, and you start to get some of that, some of these kind of insights in breath work, how anything that you thought had to hold yourself back in life, it doesn't have to. And you start to see that you are the author of your life starting from now. And it doesn't have to be held back or constricted in any way by anything that's happened in your past. Isn't that beautiful? When you, when you are no longer a victim and I've seen it. So your method is my new favorite method that we're like, I didn't like go, go get, do, do Michael stuff here. But um, what I've seen is by releasing that trauma, Michael, and by releasing the stress from the body, the hormones of stress go down and yeah. then the normal hormone production starts working again. So you're going back to running your heart the way it's supposed to and running your lungs and your uterus and all of your organs are starting to work again because you're no longer stuck in a fight, flight or freeze mode. And now your body is actually operating in that rest and digest state. Right. Yeah, exactly. And all of that is just through breath work. Isn't that amazing? That, that's kind of like, if there was a shortcut to take from being very, very ill emotionally and maybe even physically to getting well through breathing, who would have thought, right? But you cannot bottle it. You cannot patent it. So it's not as readily available. I, I want to be clear that like breath work is not like, you know, in, in today's society, we're kind of trained to look for quick fixes. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, take a pill, you'll be okay kind of thing. Breathwork's not like that. Fortunately or unfortunately, it is a journey. And it's kind of like if you've been like st stuffing this stuff into your body for years or decades, you know, one breathwork session is not going to fix everything. And so it's really about this inner guidance in each session brings up exactly what's appropriate for you to process in that moment and what you're actually ready to process. Uh, so how frequently does somebody who work with you 
do they do breath works? Is it once a week? Is it, it do, do you have like initial, like if somebody is really unwell, do you uh, ask them to do it more frequently than not? So first of all, I just want to just take a little sidetrack. There, there are certain psychological and physiological conditions where breath work wouldn't be appropriate to do. And, you know, the, 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 there's not like hundreds and hundreds, but there are a few important ones. There's like, for instance, uh, if you have like cardiovascular disease, prior heart attacks, because you can move around a lot and kind of, you know, you know, put some pressure on your cardio system. There is, if you have some serious neurological issues, you know, epilepsy, there's a few like that, which, which are listed. But for, you know, 98% of the population, it's fine. So it's, it's really about, so once you're, you, you don't have those contraindications, you know, you just go right in. And the interesting thing about breath work is that, you know, again, and this is part of how I've developed my modality, the whole purpose is, is to get people more in touch with their own self-empowerment and that they already have the answer. So I never tell people you should do breath work three times a week or once a week or mm -hmm. once a month. This is all about people starting to look inside for the answers. And people always ask me this, oh, how often can I do this? You can do it as from a physiological perspective. There's no limit. You could do it, you know. It's breathing. Day, but, you know, it's not yeah. like it's going to wear you out or. or right. Yeah. But, but it does bring stuff up that is wanting to be come up to be re released and experienced. Sometimes like your body's releasing a lot of bioenergetic blocks. Anytime you suppress an emotion into your system, there's always this kind of bioenergetic blockage that's also attached and your body just wants to get rid of that because it's mm -hmm. really making it difficult for your body to really give you the energy, the vibrant energy that you're supposed to have every day because it's putting so much of its energy into suppressing and, and working through these blockages. Yeah, so I've, I've really heard a story of one of the women that done your, your workshop. She said that she felt like she was hit by a train afterward for a, yeah. a bit because her body had to process so many emotions and she felt worn out. It was good. Like afterward, she was happy, but she felt physically drained afterward. Yeah. And, and that's really the key to, you know, when do you want to do your next session? It's kind of like sometimes afterwards, people can feel drained if they've processed a lot of stuff and released it, or they can feel super energized, or they can feel like they're just more emotionally open and they're still kind of just getting more in touch with who they are. And they're still kind of working with that experience. So basically, you want to wait until you have felt like you fully processed that experience. If you feel really tired afterwards, wait till your energy comes back to normal. You know, and wait till you feel actually guided, till you kind of just look inside, close your eyes. Is it time for an next breathwork experience? And if you're guided to yes, go for it. Some people do it. I've had people who've done it for 18 months for two to three times a week. I've had other people who do it once a month. So, and it's really about just having them trust their own inner guidance. This is everything I do is about learning to trust your own inner guidance. And that's even true with the breath. Like the breath, I, I will give people a certain technique to get started with. And then I'll tell them, you know, once you get to 15 or 20 minutes into the session, just trust your body. Let go of the technique and let your body find its way. Again, trust your body wisdom, trust your inner guidance. Which, so which is, is fascinating. When I attended your workshop, that's exactly what happened. I know you instructed people to breathe in a certain way. And I tried like at one point, no, but then I felt like my body took over. Yeah. And instead of the body following the brain, I felt like the brain was following the body. Like wherever you lead me, I will go. There were moments when it would lull down and I feel like, okay, I'm okay to breathe normal, my regular breath, reposition my body. And then I was like, oh, here it comes again. <laughs> kind of like when I was having my baby and I was going through contractions, between contractions, like, I'm back to normal. When the contraction comes, you're like, oh my God, I have to follow this train. For me, it was more or less in that sense that I knew when the body was prompting me to breathe again in that specific way. And I found what was amazing because I was doing nose mouth breathing, mm -hmm. uh, open mouth, that never did I get like dry lips or anything like that. I did not feel partial. It was just like this mm -hmm. amazing, almost like moisturizing experience. And I was blown away by that because I expected the opposite. That, that's perfect. Yeah. So you did it exactly correct. Just let your body take over. And that's one of the differences between this type of breath work than almost every other. In most breath work, they'll tell you, okay, this is the breathing technique. You need to do this all the way through. So it's like they're in essence telling you how to breathe. Well, and but then you have to control it with your frontal cortex. Am I breathing exactly. that way? If not, so it's defeating the purpose because you're overly engaged in observation. Right. 
Exactly. And it's, at least it's defeating the purpose from my perspective on breath work. So, which is where the, a big piece of it is trusting your inner guidance, self-empowerment, being able to kind of cast off these kind of feelings of any type of victimhood that you feel in your life. And so that's, that's always kind of intertwined in everything I do in the breath work. In the same way that in many types of breath work, they're guided. Like during the breath work, the facilitator will talk all the way through. Or they'll use music, and there is, uh, for your listeners, there is music that goes all the way through the breath work that does play an important role. But, you know, like the music will have English words, which you kind of pull your mind and guide you in a certain way. And in neurodynamic breath work, it's completely unguided. It's like Wait, which was inner- one, what I appreciated so much why I wanted to reach out to you specifically because I believe that guided meditation, guided breath work can have a place, but I did find because I'm already a thinker by birth, right? That's what I do. I find that it's almost counterproductive for me because my brain is overly engaged at that time. But right. to trust the process, what was fascinating in your workshop, you're like, okay, I'm going to give you all uh, guidance and I'll be here hanging out. But for the next 55 minutes, this is what you do. And you were gone, basically. Like you were there, but you were not. It, it, it was amazing in a sense that it was a surrender to the process without any obstruction. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it, it's important from a safety perspective that I always tell people that during their session, if they ever need support, they can you know, type a chat to me and I'll interact with them. But 97% of the time, they just process right through and it's all coming from themselves. And I don't want them to leave, you know, it's kind of like if you do a substance, whether it's ayahuasca or LSD or whatever it is, there's always a certain piece of your brain that's thinking, okay, I had this amazing experience, but the substance caused it. And it's still almost like you're, you're not responsible for your own experience. Something else is happening to you, not from within you, not for you. Exactly. And I don't want people to come away from the breath work saying, Oh, this was awesome. But if, but if Michael hadn't guided me all the way through, I wouldn't have been able to have this. You know, that's what I don't want them to come away with, like a substance. I want them to come away with, this all came from inside myself. I had these, you know, insights into my purpose in life, or I had these amazing body releases. I feel really good. And it all came from inside of me. You know, that's, yeah, that's so I, beautiful, Michael, to. because that's the whole, the whole premise of my practice is, I want to teach my clients when I work with them, all the tools, give them all that they need, that they will no longer need me once they're well. (laughs) This, the self-empowerment, self-sufficiency, because when I healed myself, I no longer wanted somebody to reach out to you because I have to have somebody's help. You know, when we needed that help once in a while, that's fine. But I wanted to be able to draw on my inner wisdom to keep me not only healing, but whole for the rest of my life. And it sounds that your philosophy resounds so much with what and how I do things too. I don't, I don't want to create people that are dependent, basically. Yes. That's, that's really important. And uh, that's the only way that the world is going to move forward. You know, if, if we have a world full of people who have a victim mentality, we're never going to move forward. And it's kind of like it's, it's not a person's fault if they have a victim mentality. We grow up with, in that environment in the sense that if you look at any marketing, it's always about, you know what? you're not happy right now, but once you use my product, you will be happy. Mm-hmm. And if you don't use my product, you're never going to be happy. If you don't buy this $300,000 car, you're never going to get the girl of your dreams. If, if you don't do this, you won't get that. So we've got this kind of imprinting from childhood that, you know, we don't have the power to really create our own Victimhood. emotional states. Victimhood. I am um, yeah. in, in my neighborhood. I have a young woman that was uh, going into psychology field and she said I had to quit because a lot of what they teach there is victimhood. People are victims or they're byproducts. And what you and I are talking about, yes, we might have has, had some causes in our life that led us to become who we are now, but it doesn't mean that we have to remain there. And we can, in fact, train ourselves to become the creators as opposed to victims. Exactly. Yes. Well, fantastic. And- what I would like to do is a couple more questions here. First of all, if you are watching right now, I absolutely can tell you, you will not figure this out on your own, although it's eventually when you know it, you can do it on your own. I highly recommend that, and we're going to give out Michael's information here shortly, that you go to one of his workshops at least to experience it. 
there's nothing like having this step-by-step -step guide of step number one, step number two, this is what you don't do, this is what you do. And then being there observed by somebody who has been through this and guided through that process, it's absolutely replaceable. I would not have ever done it on my own. Although I am a do it yourself for till today. I, I like to figure things out. But when I said shortcut earlier, it doesn't mean that it solves it all in one set, but shortcut that I don't have to uncover this on my own and there's somebody who can do it for me. With that in mind, so what we're, I'm going to ask Michael to do right now is a short demo, maybe like 20 second demo of the breathing technique. And then after that, we're going to talk about you all finding Michael on his website, signing up for his workshop to experience it for yourself. And I can guarantee you that this experience, when you go through it, will forever change you in how you uh, are relating to yourself and to the world outside. So Michael, if you can please explain the breathing and show us how that would work. So when people go to, to you, they kind of know a little bit of what to expect. Yeah, so in essence, um, there's a certain part of the introductory talk. I always do about a 30 minute introductory talk to make sure everybody has the information they need, they can process safely, they have a good sense of what's going to happen, which you listen to two or three times. And if you continue, you can just pop in after it. So, but, you, but it's a very important information. And part of it has to do with the breath. So there's a specific technique that I start people off with. And the purpose of that is, is that you want to move the air kind of fairly quickly at the beginning in order to drop into the process as quickly as possible to create these physiological changes. And so there's four instructions. The first is, at least at the start, to breathe in and out through the mouth. And there's three reasons for that. One is that you can move air more quickly. Second of all, whenever you're in an emotional state in your life, if you observe, you're always doing mouth breathing. If you're crying, if you're angry. So it kind of gives your psyche permission to release. And the third thing is just that, you know, you're encouraged to, to make sounds during the breath work if your body wants to make them. So when you're breathing in through the mouth, it's easier. It's like, ah, ah. So it's just easier to make sounds. So we start people off with breathing in and out through the mouth. And the second and most important thing is you want to breathe in a very deep way into the diaphragm. So your belly and your diaphragm expands when you breathe in. So you're taking four Kind of like breaths. babies. When we see newborns, that's how Yeah, exactly. Breathe. Yeah. If you watch a newborn sleep, they'll, they'll breathe very deeply into, into their belly versus... You know, as people get older, they breathe much more shallow into their chest. So this is a full deep breath. You know, like we want you to fill your lungs about the 90, 95% of capacity. And then the third thing is, is that you want to breathe in a way that's connected. So you don't hold your breath at the top or the bottom. There's just this beautiful circle of breath. You, but you want to breathe in a way that you're not stressing yourself. You're not like pushing or creating any tension in your body. So it's kind of like, just this wonderful, beautiful, relaxed breath. You're taking in air. You're taking in the stuff of life. Just in a sense, like, let's say you wake up in the morning, you open your eyes. Oh, another beautiful day. Ah, so, so it's not stressful in any way. It's just this beautiful breath, but it's much deeper than normal, and it's more connected. And you're always breathing in or breathing out. And just either at normal pace or a little faster than normal, but it's not like this kind of panting breath, like <sighs> like the depth of the breath is more important mm -hmm. than the actual speed. So, so for instance, for me, it would look like, the, you know, kind of this, if you can see. So it's yes. kind of like, this is, so if you watch, uh, if you watch my belly, you can kind of see that uh, it's kind of expanse. Yeah, so it's so it's quite simple, but it's very beautiful. It's just breathing. It's, it's just yeah, yeah. breathing. So if you're it's, watching, you're going, yeah. "Oh my God, how can breathing bring so much healing transformation?" You absolutely have to experience it. But that kind of breathing is simple. It's safe. It's easy. Question for you, Michael: What was the? I would love to hear about one case study that you've heard that was absolutely like mind blowing. That breath work transformed somebody's life to where it was not was not recognizable. One example was that one that I gave of the woman who reconnected with her mom just by having this kind of out-of-body experience almost of being in the psyche of her mom when she was a kid. That was extremely powerful for her because it just reconnected their whole family. I mean, that was a very life-transforming experience. You know, in terms of, you know, some people ask me, you know, can I heal myself physically? You know, if I have a physical issue or something like that. 
there's obviously no guarantee about anything about physical symptoms or this or that, but it is true that there are times when sometimes something that's happening to you physically can have a psychological component to it. And just, I mean, one example, there was this man who came in for breath work and did a few sessions and he'd been in a car accident. And in the car accident, it was quite intense, quite severe. And one of the physical residuals of that was he couldn't move his arm, one of his left arm passed horizontal. And he tried physical therapy, he tried chiropractic, he tried this, he tried that, acupuncture, nothing helped. And in one of his breathwork sessions, he actually re-experienced the accident. But in this case, rather than, you know, when, when you go through a trauma like that, many times your psyche dissociates and you don't even remember exactly what happened in the moment of, of, of the accident or whatever. And he actually went back and re-experienced exactly what happened when the car was hit, how he felt, or how he felt in his body, and just went through it. It was an extremely uncomfortable experience for him, feeling that whole thing that had been suppressed in, in his psyche for so long. But he went through it, and after that breathwork session, his, his arm was okay. And you know, it, I mean, you know, it took him a while to get used to it, but he had this amazing kind of release of this physical symptom that was attached to this you know, suppressed emotional experience in his, in his body. And obviously with breath work, there's no guarantee you're ever... The work I do, there's no guarantees, but nevertheless, we see so many transformations. Right. Yes. So sometimes people do, you know, get some relief through just this, you know, breaking this connection to this like emotional thing that's in their body and this kind of physical thing that's... That and you... there is, I, um, I work, so like I said, a lot of the women that I work with, they have the trauma and without the feel, what I see, Michael, is when we release emotional trauma, the body can go back to functioning the way it was meant to, and then the body can heal itself. So maybe it was not like the cure, but it's a cause and effect. It's an additional step that gets you there. Maybe it's an over, not an overnight healing, but it's one of the stepping stones to get to it. Yeah. Just to go to breathing instead of being in fight or flight, that is already a healing experience. Right. And then the, the chemicals you produce during a time of breathing that will give you a different sensation, that also can be healing. So I, I find that very powerful. Yeah. Well, with that in mind, I want to ask you, where can my listeners and viewers find you? So we offer everybody a free first session just to try it out and see if it works for them. And you just have to go to my website, which is breathworkonline.com. And there's a blue button at the top that says like something like try a free breathwork session. You just have to click on that, follow the instructions. We do four to five live facilitated breathwork sessions every week at different times of the day, different days of the week. So you can just choose one that works for you and just see how it feels to you. It's, it's, it's like uh, breathwork's not for everybody, but for many, many people, it can really support them in creating these life transforming experiences that, that they can then take back into their world. I think it's very beneficial and I think it should be experienced and it's very empowering because you go to a place from frontal cortex, justifying everything, to surrendering to the innate wisdom of your physical body that is not a machine. But to me, I, I find that my body is a very spiritual being and I connect and I become one with it. Instead of being this fracture, spirit, soul, and body experience, I just have this human spiritual experience all in one. You don't have to feel like you're unhealthy or you have to like work with trauma or something to do breath work. There are many people who come in who feel like, oh, I'm doing great in my life, but I just want to take it to the next level. I want to see what's blocking me from really fully blossoming you know, to who I, I want to be in the world and, and what I can contribute to the world. I want to regain my just more zest for life. So it doesn't have to be like you feel like you have to fix something or anything yeah. like that. It's That's just a great wherever point. you're at, it can take you to the next level. So it's, it's really, even if you feel awesome about, yes, this it's is It's like a tune-up. You want to go to the next level. That can be it. I, I think because this is the work I do with a lot of people who are sick, I, I tend to go there. But you're absolutely right. When I did your breath work, it was not because I was broken. I was not whole. I was like, I need this more deeper experience because there's so much going on in the world. And I just want to feel better. 
Yeah. And that was enough. And I had an amazing experience. My body was doing quite a uh, gymnastic workout on the floor. I was like, I'll go with it. I trust it. And I now tell people, like, when you do my, Michael's workshop, just know that your body might do things that you don't expect, but it's a beautiful experience. It's not scary and, at all. And uh, Alina, when I said it's, it's kind of like not for everyone, what I meant was that, you know, many times your breathwork experiences can be a bit uncomfortable. As you know, like when you're releasing stuff out of your body that's been stuck, and, you know, sometimes they're just blissful, and, but sometimes they can be a bit uncomfortable with releases and stuff. So it's really about, you know, you have to be willing to be okay with that. Yes, I'm okay with being a little uncomfortable for 10, 20, 30 minutes. So I don't hold this thing in my body for the next 30 years. Absolutely. So, well, and it's so, worth it. And we're doing this not to impress anyone, like you said, but we're doing it for ourselves. I love that quote from your website. We, we take over what we've been uh, conditions we have been hypnotized you think we're powerless but yes. to do this it's a, one of the pieces that we don't have to but we can do to feel powerful again to feel like creators or co-creators depends what whatever your spiritual beliefs are but i think it can be powerful but michael thank you so much for taking over an hour of your time to speak to our, my audience and i do believe that everybody should experience breath work at least once in their life so yes, thank you. you so much for your wisdom thank you so much for the work that you're doing and I know that those who are brave enough and those who love themselves enough and they come and experience your uh, workshop, I actually will want to hear from you. So if you end up going to Michael's workshop, just drop me a note on our website or email me info at 360impactcoaching.com. I want to hear from you. I want to know what, what has happened for you in your life. With that said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in for this episode of the Health Wizard podcast. I'll catch you next time. And for now, Michael and I wish you a great rest of the day. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed today's topic. If you did, make sure to subscribe to the Health Wizard podcast. And please don't forget to tell others about it. If you would like to get more information about me and what I do, how I help amazing human beings just like you to achieve their dream health, go to www.360impacthealth.com. Go to the contact page and shoot me a note. Thank you so much for listening. I'll catch you on the next episode of the Health Wizard Podcast. This is your host, Yelena, wishing you optimal natural health.